Hello students of dynamics, this is Dr. Dan Baker. And today's video, we're gonna focus on the use of our impulse momentum equation, but in cases where we don't have any impulse. Okay, so we call this conservation of linear momentum. So you'll remember that the impulse momentum equation looks like this, sum of all of your masses times your initial velocity, plus the sum of the integral of the sum of the forces dt. Now again here, I'm putting these sums out front, talking about multiple particles. So we can do those for each one of the terms. Now this is a vector, this is a vector, and then also our final sum of our mv2 is a vector, right? So it's a vector relationship. And again, the sums out front are looking at the summation of either momentum or impulse happening on multiple particles in a system. And so we have, if we have no impulse, and this whole center term goes to zero, it shouldn't be a surprise we end up with sum of mv1 is equal to sum of mv2. Okay, so this is true for a one-dimensional sense. It's also true for a two-dimensional sense. We'll talk about both of those today. But this is fundamentally our conservation of linear momentum equation. Now, you can think about the implications of this um, if we, let's say you're on a, uh, you're on a boat. Now, I'm kind of particular what my boats look like because I used to build boats. Um, but let's see, you're coming in here to your dock, say, so that's not moving. And then here's your water. Okay, so here's your water. And here is your bench seat in your boat. So this is like a little canoe. And let's say that you are going to step. Now I do some really good stick figures here. So let's say so you're stepping out here um, onto the dock. And of course you're wearing a life jacket. There's your head. And of course you need arms. So you're stepping from your boat to the dock. And let's say that your boat was initially floating in here at a velocity. So we can call this, so if this is your boat will be V and you will be the letter A. We could say that VB1, which is also equal to VA1, right? Your initial velocity is the same as the boat, is equal to 0 0.1 meters per second. Okay, so you're floating towards the dock. And then you're going to step out, and let's say that you're going to step out at a velocity, this is VA2, equal to one meter per second, anxious to get to dry land. Let's account for some masses here. Let's say your mass is 70 kilograms, and the boat's mass is 40 kilograms. And our question is, what happens to the boat? Right? And if you've ever done this kind of exercise, you realize that as you step off of a boat, something happens. And the thing that happens is that boat's going to move away from the dock. Fundamentally, it's going to move away from the dock because of friction that you're transferring to the boat right off of the tip of your toe. Okay, so you actually have a friction force, which is going back in this direction, transferring an internal impulse. Okay, realize in a multiple particle system, we still can have impulses. It's just these impulses are conservative. They're being transferred from one particle in the system to the other particle in the system. Okay, so we can set up our conservation of linear momentum, fundamentally a 1D problem. So using this equation right here, and we had initial mass of 70 plus 40, combined mass of you and your canoe, and uh, value here 0 0.1. Now realize that we do need to establish an axis system as we think about this problem. So we're calling everything going here to the left as positive. Okay, that's the direction our initial velocity is going, and then that's the the direction that our person's final velocity is going. Okay, so this term right here, the sign comes from the axis system. Okay, it's an important thing that um, on these momentum problems, we do need to account for direction, and that's because we have these two vectors, right? These are velocity vectors, hence they have direction. 
So um, the final condition is that you have your 70 kilograms moving at also positive one meter per second. And then the question is what's happening to the boat. And so we can call that VB2. So computing this, we find out that the left side is bigger than the right side. And so we're going to end up with a negative value. VB2 is equal to negative 1.475 meters per second. And so the boat is moving away faster than you are moving away from the boat, mainly because it has a lower mass. Okay, so um, some things you could counteract this is to tie your boat up first, right? Be able to hold some tension force in a rope between your boat and the dock. Um, have a friend hold on to the boat while you're stepping off. Something along those lines to get you off this boat safely without falling into the water. So one of the cases where we will apply conservation momentum is in the impact of multiple particles. We're going to take a look at both one-dimensional and also two-dimensional impacts. So we're going to start here with 1D impact, which can also be thought of as direct central impact. Is it just another way of saying that? Essentially that the center of mass of one body is colliding with the center of mass of another body. Okay, and so they're going to be hitting each other. Of course, as you end up getting what we call oblique impact, we get the centers of mass not directly colliding in line with them or another. And then even the more complicated form of collision is when we're dealing with rigid bodies versus particles, you can actually end up with spinning from impact. Okay, and so we actually won't even get all the way to that in dynamics, um, but we will talk here about impact for particles, assuming these particles are infinitesimally small and they're um, essentially either colliding in one dimension or two dimensions. Okay, so here is a figure from your Hibbler textbook. This is figure 1514. And what we can see is that we've got two particles. And in this case, we've got particle A moving faster than particle B. And so it's gonna hit particle B. As it does, each of these particles exerts a force over a certain amount of time on each other. There's some point of maximum deformation. And then they're gonna start to push back. Okay, so we call this um, force that they're hitting, their deformation impulse, the force where they're bouncing back, their restitution impulse. And so then finally, we have them moving at a different speed than they were before. Basically, ball two would be moving much, much faster. Um, ball one, or ball A, I guess, would have lost some of its momentum, its MV, and be moving slower. Okay, so that's the general idea. So to watch that play out in a slow-mo video, this is pretty awesome. Some of the slow-mo guys. So obviously a stationary head. Oh, a soccer ball. Wind it back here. So here is our, our impulse, right? A force between the head and the ball. Here the force is gonna be applied. We're going to meet some point of maximum deformation of both his face and also the ball. And then things are going to bounce back. All right. And there it is pushing back. So I'll put that link in the video notes if you want to watch that over and over. Um, but pretty pretty graphic demonstration of deformation and restitution impulses, okay? So the way that we relate these deformation and, and restitution impulses is using what's called the coefficient of restitution. All right, so this coefficient of restitution, we use the small letter E, one of multiple variables, you use the small letter E. And so this is officially equal to the restitution impulse Keep in mind, impulse is just force times time divided by the deformation impulse. Now the restitution impulse can never be bigger than the deformation impulse. And so this relationship is always one or less. If I write this in equation form, we could write this as the integral of R dt divided by the integral of P dt. Now measuring these two terms would not be easy, 
right? Finding the amount of force of the soccer ball on that person's face, changing a lot over time, right? A, a rapid change in time. And so you'd have to have a high sampling rate and super difficult to measure. And so in order to measure things a little bit easier, we are essentially going to convert this relationship into a velocity relationship. And the reason we can do that is that we know that the change in momentum is equal to the impulse, right? That's essentially what the impulse momentum equation does for us. And so we can rewrite this equation that E is equal to, and I'll put it in terms of variables here and then I'll write it out in words, VB2 minus VA2. So this is, if we have particle A and B, two is final, one is initial, and A and B are particles. Okay, and we're going to divide that by, it's going to be the flip of the order of A and B. Okay, so this is going to be VA1 minus VB1. Okay, so your final velocity is on the top, your initial velocity is on the bottom. And one way to justify how or why we need this exchange, noticing here that right here's A, here's A, here's B, here's B. So the swap of these is if we apply this equation in a simplified situation of 1d with only one particle, right? So E is equal to, again, VB2 minus VA2 divided by VA1 minus VB1. So if we don't have particle B, it has no velocity. So this would be analogous to bouncing a ball off of a non-moving wall. And so in this case, we end up with a relationship that tells us that E is equal to negative VA2 divided by VA1. And so you can break this into two different parts. One is that we have a negative sign out front it means that our outgoing velocity is in the opposite direction than our incoming, right? Because the ball bounced off of the wall and these are directional terms. The other part that we can see here is we have a ratio, fundamentally E, which is between zero and one, is equal to the ratio of our output velocity over our input velocity, okay? So if you don't lose any energy, hence you don't lose any velocity, we have an E of one. If the ball sticks to the wall, we have an E of zero. Okay, so uh, let me just write out those two terms here. So if E is equal to 1, we call this perfectly elastic. So a perfect bounce. No kinetic energy lost at all, hence no velocity lost at all. And E is equal to 0. It's like if you're throwing your gum against the wall and it sticks. We call this perfectly plastic. So to put this in the context of solving problems, we have our conservation of momentum equation, MAVA1, that's a vector, plus MBVB1, initial everything on the left side, and final on the right, MAVA2 plus M B, V, B, 2. All velocity terms are vectors. Okay, so as you're thinking about what equations you need to solve problems, you will always need this first one. Okay, any problem that you have any kind of impact, it doesn't matter what the coefficient of restitution is equal to, it doesn't matter if it's 1D versus 2D, like you're going to need the conservation of momentum equation. You'll bring in your coefficient of restitution equation any time that E is greater than zero. It turns out that if the particles stick together, 
Okay, whether they're coming in together like they did on the canoe example, or whether they're going out together, like you have two pieces of gum and they're going to stick to each other, the velocities will be the same of both particles on either the left or the right side of the equation. Okay, and so that reduces your need for an additional equation. Okay, so this is going to be equation one, equation two, um, and then as we get into two dimensional motion, there'll be a third equation, and it's actually the easiest one of all. So let's work a quick example using these two equations. And so for this example, let's say that we have a rod and this rod is fixed on both ends and we have two different masses. We have a mass here we're gonna call B and a mass over here, which we're gonna call A. It turns out that mass A and mass B are both four kilograms the same size and their incoming velocity here of b is five meters per second and then a is moving at twice that rate 10 meters per second and so we want to find out what happens to their final velocities right because they're going to hit and um, something's going to happen okay so let me go through two quick solutions one is with e is equal to zero, right? So if they're gonna stick together, this is perfectly plastic. We know that MA VA1 plus MBVB1, this is equal to the sum of their masses, MA plus MB, and the final velocity VB2. Once again, if E is equal to zero, we don't need our coefficient of restitution equation because we only end up with our one unknown, the final velocity. Let me note one more thing before we assign values. We need to have an axis system, okay? So we're gonna call this positive going to the right. So all velocities going to the right will be positive, to the left will be negative. And so we have four kilograms times 10 for VA, we have four kilograms times a minus five for VB. The sum of their masses is eight and the unknown VB we find equal to 2.5 meters per second. So after they stick together, they're going to go to the right, right? Because we got a positive value for this at 2.5 meters per second. To work this problem again, using E is equal to zero, 0.8 okay so now we have a coefficient of restitution we now need to bring in our coefficient of restitution equation and so we're going to use fundamentally the same equation i'm going to add the numerical terms here four times ten plus four times minus five same initial conditions but final we're going to have different separating velocities okay so four times um, va2 plus four times vb2 now, noting here that I've written both of these terms as just positive velocities, and so if I get a negative value, I'll, I'll know they're gonna go to the left. I get a positive value, it'll confirm they're going to the right. And then a coefficient of restitution, E, um, and this is going to be equal to, again, VB2 minus VA2 divided by initials, flip of the order, VA1 minus VB1, putting in the knowns and the unknowns. This is 0 0.8 is a given value, my coefficient of restitution. My unknowns are in the top, my final values. And then my knowns are in the bottom. So this is 10, right, which is the initial velocity of A. And then of B, it was 5, and it's a minus 5. So this ends up being minus a minus 5. Okay, because we do need to assign the directions in every single case with velocities. Okay, not just the magnitudes, but always the directions. Establish an axis system and find um, the directions of those velocities. So we have the same two unknowns in these two equations. So we could do some substitution and find out that VA2 is equal to negative 3.5 meters per second. So A happens to be going back to the left and V B2 is equal to 8.5 meters per second. 
So just talking through what these values mean, we've essentially transferred momentum from A over into B. And so we have A going back to the left at 3.5 meters per second. B is going to the right. So both of them have switched directions in this case with a much greater velocity of 8.5 meters per second. One thing that's interesting about this problem, because both of the masses were exactly the same, both of the particles actually ended up having an equal change in velocity, right? So particle A went from positive 10 to negative 3.5, so a change of 13.5 meters per second. Turns out that particle B had the exact same change, and that's because their masses were the same. They had different masses, and that gets thrown out the window. But it's kind of an interesting side note on that one. So that wraps up our lecturing on one-dimensional impact, including a few example problems related to both impact and also conservation of momentum. Hope you're having a great day.